all people are difficult. All people are disappointing. All people are a pain in the butt. And that's no, no exceptions. Much of what we do is uh, not purposeful. It's automatic, reflexive. And if we really understood it, we would laugh. So all, all of these things I think are important for partners to always do. Otherwise, when we don't have a centralized purpose and vision, we tend to create civil war. We tend to look and pick at each other. Uh, that's across the human spectrum. And so that's why you have to have forethought and think down the road and constantly create, create, create. A good, good couple can handle any load bearing without the wheels coming off. I definitely get excited to talk about relationships. I've been married for 22 years. My wife and I met each other in high school. We started dating in college and we've been together ever since. And understanding more about each other and ourselves is a fundamental key to our success learning each other's styles and 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 even the attachment styles but i'd love to learn wired for love what are some of the secrets what are some of the things that we should be talking about when it comes to relationships and connection today that all people are difficult all people are disappointing all people are a pain in the butt and that's no no exceptions and that, uh, you know, we're a difficult species to get along with. Uh, we're very good at war. Uh, we're so-so at love. Uh, and the rest is, you know, uh, uh, evident, right? About uh, all the things that we do that are good and all the things that we do that are pretty uh, pretty crappy. I think it's interesting in, in um, researching for this conversation and, and learning a little bit about you. I heard you say... Um, you know, a comment about how our brains will kind of give us this story, the version of which we we think up, which often is is not true in any capacity. And and right. some of it could just be, you know, our brain creating this story. But one of the references you used in your TED talk was riding in the car. Do you often fight in the car? And my boys get super frustrated with us because we'll start bickering in the car about the dumbest things like the air conditioning and the, and the, the little stuff and tell our, tell our listeners why that is. And what's some of the, the, the reasons behind that, because I found it fascinating. Well, the, the, it's mechanical, actually. Much of what we do is uh, not purposeful. It's automatic, reflexive. And uh, and if we really understood it, we would laugh uh, most of the time. But uh, because we are side to side, we're legally blind on the sides of our eyes. We only see the world in high definition through a little tiny pinhole called the fovea, part of the macula. And unless we're deadhead, we're going to, uh, we're going to see a face at a glance and that triggers what's called the amygdala. The amygdala is a, is a fear uh, alarm center. And so it's being triggered more frequently because that person at the side, uh, brain kind of is wary because I can't really see. We're visual animals. We verify everything visually. So now we just have the auditory, right? And the auditory uh, can be misunderstood easily. So, and the person who's driving is using resources, resources necessary for driving. Talk to me about uh, something emotional, I'll miss the exit, or I will start to uh, argue with you because I don't have the resources to think things through and I visually can't check you. So uh, my, my mind is free to visualize you according to my state of mind. If, I have, if I'm in an angry state of mind, guess what face I see? I see an angry you. And so it's static. It's not changing. Whereas if I were looking at you, I'd see the constant shifts and changes in your face, in your state. And I would adjust to that, hopefully, if I was good at this. And, uh, but not so when we're side to side. So talking in the car while driving, no good. Uh, 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 talking on the phone about that are very emotional without being able to see each other, no good. Talking uh, through text or email about solving a problem, a personal problem or an interpersonal problem, definitely no good. So uh, I want people to, if they're, if we're going to talk about something stressful, we should be in the right position, really close up, face, face to face, eye to eye, where we can watch each other like a hawk, because this is a lightning fast game under stress. Yeah, it's really interesting. I can think of times where we've been in a disagreement or something in our in our in our long marriage. Um, and and I and and we kind of meet face to face and we almost start laughing. There's there's almost like this connection yeah. that that pulls us back into the 
real uh, world, real world, right <laughs> to the present moment. And we spend very, very little time now in the present moment with our phones or screens. Uh, we're constantly inundated with data. We're constantly in our heads or on our devices. And, uh, you know, we're not here. And so, yeah, you look at each other and you laugh and go, oh, my God, I haven't seen your face in a long time, except in my head. You look different. Uh, we actually store each other's faces in our heads for weeks and months without ever looking at them. This is the law of energy conservation. We do the least amount necessary. And if we know our, if we think we know our spouse, then we go about thinking that we're wrong because we're not really paying attention. We're not up to date. We don't really look anymore because we've automated our partner. And so we think we know them. And that is uh, kind of our laziness uh, as a species. Right? So it's natural. It's, it's natural. natural. Our there, fallacies yeah, everyone, are natural. Yeah. Everyone, everyone does the same thing. By the way, I met my wife in junior high, uh, seventh grade science. So, uh, but we weren't an item through junior high and high school. We didn't, uh, we didn't hook up until uh, our forties. Really? Really. We, we, we traveled in different packs. Uh, we, we wouldn't have made it uh, had we met earlier, I think. Uh, she agrees. But we, you know, we, we lived, right? And then we lived. And even though I had a crush on her in junior high and high school, she, you know, I didn't know her. Uh, I had an image of her, right? And so, uh, so, but yeah, she was the best thing that ever happened to me. That's amazing. Yeah. Adam Duritz of the Counting Crows says that almost every song that he would write came from envisioning a story he built about the character or yeah. a, a real human that he saw, but then the storyline that he wrote about Maria or about Elizabeth or somebody that was out there that he had seen. And he created this storyline. And the crazy thing is he actually dated several of the women that he created that storyline about at some point in time in his life. A great interview I listened to with Bill Simmons, he did. You know, it's uh, most everything we do is created in our heads. Remember, we've never lived outside of our heads and never will. So it's all it's all a perception game. And but that's part of our uh, madness. But it's also part of our brilliance is that we can manifest things out of whole cloth and make stuff up like a relationship. Right? Relationships don't really exist in the physical world. You can't take a picture of one, just people. Right. So you and I create uh, uh, an invention that is a relationship. Uh, we just have to make sure we're creating the same invention. That's all. Right. Um, my wife and I met when uh, she was a pre-freshman in high school. She was my sister's friend. She brought home from cheerleading practice and we didn't start dating in high school. We started dating when she got to college, uh, which was two years after I went to college. So um, I definitely can relate. We didn't wait till our forties. We were married in our early twenties, right. but um, you know, now it's, it's been 20 plus years and we have two kids and uh, it's been a, a, a great journey. It's always interesting to me, though, to have conversations with people who married married their their spouse later in life, yeah. where they were more defined as who they are versus when you're young, you're growing up together. And I always say I always feel very blessed that we were able to grow together, not apart, yes. which is very challenging in a in a relationship because you are so different as you get older but we've been able to to be correlated and aligned for so many things that matter, which has yeah. helped us grow. That's important because um, there, there are a lot of marriages where they started in high school or they were the first loves and, and they married. It, uh, for some people, it's been a little harder because they're, they're getting brain upgrades. They're actually developing in real time. And, and that can cause some uh, struggles, right? Because they're they're operating a little bit in a vacuum. Um, they haven't made mistakes with other people as I have and my wife has. And uh, and so you kind of come together and you go, well, let's not do those again, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you make other ones. But, but, but I think when people are spending a lot of time together, they will influence each other. Time uh, spent uh, equals influence. And so uh, you guys spent apparently a lot of time together, right? Yeah. And so that's why you moved you moved together, right? But when people are drifting, they uh, they will actually be influenced by outside forces more and more, and they're likely to take sharp left turns where partners who are together a lot don't do that, right? Yeah, the Venn diagram they it starts to overlap a lot. 
Yeah, and I think I think one of the things that we've talked about as we've aged is our our purpose was the same. Our yeah. vision and our goals were the same. It was number was, one. Yeah, what was it? To, um, what was your purpose and vision? Yeah, I, I would say that that um, from the time we were young, we knew we wanted to have a family. And we we had things that happened that even when the other didn't realize how beneficial it would be, um, we were leaning into each other. I remember I grew up uh, Catholic and in a big Italian Catholic family. And six months into dating, I told my wife, who wasn't my wife at the time, I was like, hey, listen, I don't know if this is a deal breaker for you, but in my life, I see raising my kids in the Catholic church with Catholic school because it was such a defining factor for me on something that I feel helped me become who I am today, all the good parts. And um, and she said, you know, as long as God's a part of our life, I think I can do that. And then we got married and within one year of marriage, she said, hey, I want to go ahead and convert. She's a Southern Baptist. She said, I wanted to, co I want to convert. And I was like, you don't need to do that. I've done this my whole life. You know, I was trying to convince her not to. A perfect example of something that at the time See, we were two 20 something year old kids. I thought it was not needed. And, and right. you know, and I wouldn't say that it, it's mandatory. I will just say that it it has made our lives very aligned. And, you know, when when we have something bigger than ourselves, our boys both went to Catholic school. We were very involved in the school. We gave to the school in big ways with our time and energy and skills. And and it was something that was so small but became so large. And um, when you talk about the the purpose, the question, I would say our number one goal was to raise a successful family, to love each other, to show our children love and to, and to build something bigger than ourselves. And, and uh, that's gotten bigger as we've gotten older because it's gone away. It's, it's not just our two boys. It's our extended family. It's taking care of our parents. It's, you know, helping our siblings and, and being there for our nieces and nephews and just little things that we could do in our community. And I think aligning in that way has been a really, really big benefit for our marriage. Now, now are you still girlfriend and boyfriend? Yeah, I think um, so. One of the beautiful things about that is uh, after our second child, I talk about this on the show all the time. We um, we started to kind of drift a little bit and I'm and I'm hypersensitive. So um, you'll be able to to dial in my attachment style uh, as fearful or whatever it is. I'm definitely that, right? Um, but I was hypersensitive and I could just feel it. And what it was is I was dedicating a lot of time to our oldest son because I felt like that was my role in helping. And you can't do a lot with the youngest. And six months in, we're, we're on a boat um, heading over to Tortola on a week vacation in the Caribbean. And she leans into me and she says, this is our ROM weekend. And I said, "What? it sounds great. What's ROM mean, Adrian? And she said, it's the Rekindle Our Marriage weekend. And she still loves that I give her credit uh, for naming it because she did. And after that, I took it from there. And what that meant was we dated each other again. We yeah. reconnected. What I, I like to say is that we we started to like each other more often. And we realized that we had to separate from the everyday and the mundane in order to do that. And when we did that, we then made that a quarterly to semi-annually mandatory thing in our marriage, which helps us become girlfriend and boyfriend. And then a lot of the other times, let's be honest, we are literally partners. We high five as we walk up and down the steps. We might not see each other for four to five days at a time because of travel and work and life and kids but we find the time to date and we find the time to be boyfriend and girlfriend. Or do you do the same? Absolutely. I'm a big believer in courtship uh, continuing throughout life. Uh, you got you to gotta keep the courtship going and the formalities going in terms of, um, uh, you know, how you were when you were first courting, because we assume we're family, but we're not, right? Partners aren't family. Uh, we're not blood, but our kids are. Uh, right, but we're not. So we're strangers constantly trying to get to know each other, which is actually novel. So uh, so to keep ourselves alert and present, because we were talking about that, we're mostly not present, um, courtship and formalities, I think are really important to keep because if the couple goes down, pretty much everyone's screwed. So uh, you got to hold that up. 
by the way, um, my wife and I are quite different. I was raised Jewish and my wife is Christian. And we we um, are fine. <laughs> we're, just, <laughs> we're just completely okay with this. I think because we're older, and uh, the uh, the whole idea of raising children, uh, you know, is no longer an issue. But uh, but even even though I came into a family with a child already there, and I'm the stepfather, um, uh, she also. Uh, is has no problem with this, and so I think for us, our higher purpose uh, has been relationship uh, yeah. and how we conduct relationship, right? Uh, and that's been our higher purpose. So, but I will go to church with Trace, and she'll—I I don't really go to temple. I'm not religious, but she'll hang out with my ultra-religious wing of my family, yeah, and uh, and uh, and they adore her. So, so uh, you know, um, uh, we're as different as can be. And yet that's, I think, has been our superpower uh, is our difference. Again, when I was younger, probably probably wouldn't have clicked, right? I, well, I, I, I picked too many people that were too much like me. Yeah, I, I think what's really interesting is um, I just didn't know the recipe for a good relationship. I didn't know the recipe for success. And I certainly knew that one of the best things that I wanted to be when I got older was a good dad. And so it was the one thing that was really important to me that I felt like it shaped. And what's interesting today is we've got friends of all denominations and we have been to their churches and we've been a part of their children's lives and, and um, you know, culture and differences help us have a better understanding of each other and what we actually appreciate about our own upbringing. Um, but as a young person, I definitely agree who I was at 40 versus who I was at 20 were so completely different that um, I think I was holding on to what the the main things that I I was like, okay, this has got to be an important thing. Even if it's not, it's it, I, I believe it is and uh, turned out to work okay. But definitely be looking at it differently at 45 years old for sure. How old are your kids? They are uh, 18 and 15. And so we are... Uh, we're at the we're at the really interesting. So from a relationship standpoint, a lot of people that listen to this show are are getting to the point where they're going to be going through what my wife and I are are doing right now, which is um, our oldest son will be going to college in the fall, and our youngest son actually lives away at a uh, soccer academy and is oh. a full time uh, <laughs> player and student uh, for one of the major league soccer academies at at fifteen. Amazing. And so, so it's really cool and we love it, but it's created quite a unique scenario where we're almost like we are early onset, um, empty nesters. nesters. And so, um, I, another, another reason to keep courtship. Uh, yeah, it is. And we, we really need it because there are times where I make everything a big deal. I mean, we, we, we spent like all day the other day together going and running errands. And I was thinking to myself, We've got to get a wider group. We've got to spread out now. The kids have been our centerpiece and I love spending time, but we thrive with independence. We thrive with, with um, having friends that are different types of friends. And so it's, it's um, thinking bigger and thinking of ways that we can continue to develop our relationship while we put that in, in the forefront, even with the kids. And uh, she actually just stopped working. She's been a kindergarten teacher and K oh, through mm -hmm. three for 22 years and she stopped. This is her retirement year um, because of the very thing that we're talking about. It's not just about me. It was that she chose being a teacher because it provided her the ability to be a better mother. She was off in the summer. She was off by the time they got out of school. And now having our youngest son not live locally, we have a lot more flexibility with her not working to be able to travel, to be able to spend more time to watch all the games and, so we've made, again, another major decision that was very difficult together, but it's it's putting the relationship first. It's putting the family first and and learning from our mistakes. But we are we're in new territory. So any advice that you have for empty nesters, we'd love to listen to uh, to any guidance. And I don't know if this is where the couples bubble or any of the other things that you talk about are are yeah. are perfect. But, um, you know, we're all ears as we learn. 
Well, we have a uh, we have a neocortex that seeks novelty constantly. So uh, you have to sort of feed the beast. Um, and you can do that in a number of ways. One is travel. Travel is novelty, right? You you guys uh, go someplace and you have to navigate the, uh, that uh, terrain together. You have to deal with a language perhaps you don't understand yet, a culture that's not yours. And that enlivens us. That pulls us together. That is something that is we call it a third a third is uh is a third thing that the the two of you focus on to enliven the two of you right your kids are thirds right you hopefully you look at your kids and you turn to each other and you go god i love you and so proud of you i'm so happy that we we are uh, uh that we made this family you and i right um i'm so i i love that i'm here with you uh this beautiful place right you you know how to how to use your excitement over novelty and throw it to each other which by the way in our species uh creates what's called an amplification effect only our species can do that so we can actually share uh excitement and and multiply it tenfold right we get an extra 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 dose of endogenous drugs groovy drugs that make us feel great so we can recreate exciting love the very exciting love that got us here in the first place right and so a lot of people don't know this that's called joint attention so anytime we we set up other projects children is a project right it's a couple's project you don't own your children they're passing through right it's a project you work together as a couple right hopefully but then there are other projects um moving uh redecorating um uh, learning how to cook together um you know or a sport together or traveling or learning a language together there's just a million things to do but we know that human beings always do better in unions in free and fair unions when they have a third thing to uh, strive for that they have an, a a set of purposes right one that establishes their relationship the sort of the center of the universe but then other things right we have a purpose in um in making this trip the best trip uh that we can possibly make it and the vision that we're going to we're going to have the best time and we're going to high five each other at the end of the trip and then we go systematically and take off the table what could possibly go wrong right that's 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 predicting preparing and planning for what right you 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 expect the best but you plan for the worst so all, all of these things i think are important for partners to always do otherwise when we don't have a centralized purpose and vision we tend to create civil war we tend to uh uh, uh look and pick at each other uh that's across the human spectrum right and so that's why you have to have forethought and think down the road and constantly create 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 a good good couple can handle any load bearing without the wheels coming off because they're practiced right they're practiced at decision making sol problem solving and creating new things that's that's what we do unless you're mired in threat in which case you're not going anywhere uh you're spending all your time trying to feel safe and secure so what you're doing in the travel i think is great just take us along with you yeah, that's great. That's great. I we think wanna, we want to go. If we could just tell you where we'd like to go, just if you could just take us with you because we like to travel too. Yeah, where where do you travel? Is there a, is there a favorite space, favorite plot, favorite <laughs> spot? You know, I, I we, we like new places. We we've we've been all over the world teaching and training. So I think we've been to every continent but one, Antarctica, I think. So uh, maybe that will be the next one. Although, yeah, I don't, as the older I get, the, I just don't, I'm not sure how I feel about walking on ice. Um, but, uh, but you know, there are always places to go and see. And I, I can't think of an absolutely favorite. I love too many places. Well, we, uh, we differ. We differ in our favorites. I love Europe because I love it. It, it absolutely slows me down, but slows me down with purpose. So I struggle to just sit and relax because I like to do and build and create. And um, but I love Europe because everything is moving towards the next meal, which is how I've always lived my life. <laughs> so um, it's really it's a special place. Great wine, great food, romance like it is. It is my favorite kind of movie to watch, my favorite experience. 
And my wife loves the beaches. She loves the Caribbean. She loves the, you know, we went to Greece and she was not interested in going to Greece until we arrived at the resort. And she goes, you didn't tell me it was going to be beautiful beaches everywhere. And I said, I didn't know what resort we were going to. We just, we, we just picked this and I knew it was a nice one. And, and she goes, this beach is gorgeous. And everything about it was like the best of both worlds. We had to, yeah, a lot uh, of beaches, a lot of beaches in Europe. That's it. So that's so. So these are the things we learn as we experience these yeah. um, these trips. But you're right. It also part of our Ram retreats that we talk about and that we've always done. There's a part of adventure that goes with that. Like you were talking, we have to solve for something. We're learning something together. Just being on an adventure together helps align you in a way where it reminds me and her. It, it reminds us that we like each other. We don't just love each other. And, and that's such a powerful thing that I think a lot of couples um, maybe don't have the ability to do or haven't, haven't prioritized it as much. We have to cultivate it. You have to make it a priority. That speaks to organization. It sounds like the two of you are hands-on with your relationship. A lot of people aren't. A lot of people go into relationship without any kind of sense of why they're doing it and what's the point of the relationship. They do it because of feeling, uh, right? Emotion, I love you, I'm attracted to you, that lasts a good hot minute. Uh, it has to be based on something uh, meteor, based on a purpose, which is uh, which uh, is above and beyond feeling, right? We do it because we decided this is the best thing we could do. We, we, do, we do it because we decided this is the right thing to do or the good thing to do. So say us both. And couples, unlike any other free and fair union, they don't organize, they don't structure, they don't create a hierarchy, they don't create uh, principles of how they're going to govern each other, right? Basically boss each other around as equal, uh, um, you know, power sharing uh, partners, right? And so uh, so that speaks to a very important issue is uh, how little partners structure their the meaning and the purpose of their relationship and they are rudderless uh, because of it and they fight because of it because they don't create policies. So they don't know how to to get consensus and to govern by uh, by taking their differences into account, but coming to uh, areas where they will agree and where they are the same. So it sounds like the two of you have mastered that or maybe your naturals, I don't know. I think we're working at it. I mean, I think the, the bottom line is if we're being honest, there's always challenges. You're, you're always working through those challenges. And there are things that you, like you've mentioned, we are individually wired for the way we see things and, and how we feel. And so it's, it's a constant growth for any relationship to be aware and attuned to what's happening. And, and um, uh, I just interviewed someone, um, uh, a great guest last week, and the conversation was about women and perimenopause and menopause and how hormonally so many things shift and how things become hypersensitive and these challenges of it's like a, and it was a really interesting conversation because it's another challenge in any relationship. As we age, we also go through changes. And yeah. unfortunately women have to go through more than we tend to go through in, in, uh, in the hormonal mm -hmm. and, and emotional mm -hmm. state. Um, but maybe, maybe it's, you know, men are doing the same things in different ways, but, um, it was super interesting just to listen to the challenges that still, that still will be on the horizon, but knowing that we're, we're working at it, we're always growing. We're always trying to get better. That's part of the battle. I think it's just meeting each other in a, in a space where, where you both want to be. Well, if you also, you're moving through time and that's part of the whole thing. You're time travelers. You're the, you're the constant, right? Uh, that's running through everything. The two of you move through time. You're the insiders. Everyone else should be the outsiders. You are on stage. Everyone else is off stage. You know what's going on because you're confidants. You're, you're, you're holding hands, hopefully in heaven as well as in hell. And, and so you know things that other people will never know. Um, you are you are literally in each other's care. And so if you put the relationship at the top of the food chain, where I believe it should be, uh, the couple should be at the top uh, because the couple is running everything and everyone in charge of everything, right? Two bosses, two generals, two governors. 
if uh, everyone is depending on this couple being happy and getting along well, otherwise the trains don't work, right? And nothing, you don't make widgets in the factory, things aren't going to operate well. Everyone's going to suffer. So that's why practically, tactically, one would put the relationship at the top. Therefore, you serve each other. If you serve each other, it doesn't matter what your partner's going through. Um, you are, uh, <laughs> that's your wing person. You are responsible to that person. Uh, you're each other's caregivers. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, slings and arrows, vicissitudes of life happen, but you. But one thing remains the constant: we're radically devoted, and we have each other's backs, and uh, you know, and uh, we're each other's person, uh, right? In the foxhole together, and so that's really, uh, really important. Again, to have an idea of why we are, right? Uh, purpose, which uh, which overrides uh, the shifting, um, you know, moodiness, uh, the uh, the feeling de jour, uh, you know, the boredom, the the thoughts of, gee, did I pick right? Or uh, maybe I want to get a Corvette and get hair plugs, or whatever it is that we go through during midlife. Um, that the constant is that uh, this is ride or die. You know, we know exactly where the center of the universe is, and that's how we operate as a couple it's a as a team sport it's not a solo sport that's the message i try to get across uh because i'm trying to um i'm trying in my own way to save the world you mentioned that you're fear-based well i've been fear-based my whole life afraid of everything and so part of what drives me personally is the state of the human condition and uh you know and how we're seeing that uh you know come to 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 manifest in ways that are not the greatest today yeah um and so uh so I, I feel very strongly about this whole idea of something we call secure functioning right um fair uh relationships of equal power and that uh, remain fair just and mutually sensitive based on social contract theory uh so that's where my heart is we were talking before about passion yeah uh, i'd like to i'd like to settle the 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 nasty parts of our human condition uh and uh work towards getting us to work together uh it starts i think with the the couple yeah well i i i love the reference because um ultimately you know you work to having a secure relationship and a secure attachment and to to be a a the best version of yourself that you can be and just because you were built some way or you were you were started in one mold you can build out of that and i love that that messaging i also love the fact that you know i think too often in early relationships especially when we're young we're transaction based you yeah. know it's all about me 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 i feel loved when we do this i feel loved when when this happens i i i and the more we focus on the word i the less we're actually building relationships, the, the less yeah. we're actually building that connectivity. And, and, um, and when we go from taking to giving, you're talking about serving our partners in a positive way and building that relationship so that we understand where that ebb and flow and that rhythm actually applies. And the yeah. more you go out there and teach that the better relationships are going to be, the better families are going to be, the stronger the next generation will be. And, and, um, and that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty nice impact to make on the world. It, it, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, I studied babies for uh, quite a while, and and you learn a lot when you uh, watch babies and you watch babies with their caregivers. Uh, you begin to understand uh, how we are and how nature repeats itself, and uh, it's not really rocket science, as a lot of people start to think. It, uh, you know, we we are what we see, what we hear, what we experience. That's about as fancy as we get. And so, uh, so we want to uh, make sure that uh, that we shift people towards relationship first uh, rather than self first. In truth, a secure functioning relationship isn't the same as secure attachment. It is uh, a set of social contracts that will get you to secure attachment by having a relationship that is that is thought through that is fair just mutually sensitive collaborative and cooperative um so that's what keeps us to you know to uh our feet to the fire that we decide is the fire and that then allows for secure attachment but but uh, uh secure functioning is basically growing up 
right? It's accepting differences. All people are disappointing, including you. Uh, you know, there is no perfect person. Everyone's perfectly imperfect. Um, you have to learn like a three-legged race to move together or you don't move. Um, you know, there's this matter of interdependence where you have the same things to gain and the same things to lose. And this is, a, I think, a mature way of understanding human relationships, which is needed because at our baseline, we're, we're you know, our species, we're, we're good on a nice day when we're happy. We're maybe not so pleasant to be near if we're having a bad day. And uh, that's the, that's what we're trying to, that's sort of my wife's and I, I, I our ministry, because uh, we're talking about faith, uh, we're of different faiths, uh, you know, but we're of the same faith when it comes to our belief in elevating relationship uh, across the board, because uh, that is a uh, an ongoing struggle for us uh, people, right, human beings. Uh, we tend to be one person oriented, me, my, I, and you, 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 um, which leads us to a lot of things, uh, good things, but also messed up relationships, uh, lawsuits, uh, estrangement, all sorts of things, because uh, what we're after is to get orient people to be pro-self and pro-relationship at the same time, neither one nor the other alone, right? Pro-self, pro-relationship. I have to consider you and me at the same time, or there will be uh, war, there will be resentment, there will be right uh, something to pay for. So that's really what we're about. And a lot of this, of course, is based on research and science. Uh, so it's uh, very much um, a tactical, uh, strategic idea, but it is extremely important for um, getting along with other people because that's tough for our species actually. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm interested in, in your thoughts on this. You, if you were to ask most people, uh, a lot of the things I've, I've read about a lot of the, the, the opinions that come out say that the next generation is really going to struggle with relationships. They're becoming more me oriented and, and more transaction oriented. And it's hard to, it's hard to generalize an entire generation because I feel like it's usually just a lack of understanding between the two, uh, the, the, the different generations. I'm at the edge of Gen X. Like I don't even consider myself a Gen X, but I'm certainly not a millennial. I'm in that, that like four to five year gap where none of it is, uh, is applicable. And so some things I look at with millennials and I'm like, I don't get it. And other things I look at with Gen X, I'm like, that was never me. And, um, so I don't want to generalize, but I'm interested in, from a relationship standpoint, do you think this is be, you, with your, with your purpose and the impact you're trying to make, do you feel like it's getting, um, it's, it's going to be harder as you go, or it's something that will get a little easier? Uh, it's too early to tell because, uh, these, uh, these, a lot of these folks have not yet fully matured and, we're shaped by the conditions around us. We're shaped by the environment, and that's what molds and shapes us. It's not simply, uh, you know, the the, uh, the culture I mean. we're in, right? So, for instance, war changes people, right? Um, famine changes people. Climate change will change people. Um, the everything that's going on right now, which is approaching a bit of chaos. Uh, changes people. So we don't really know. Uh, it's very easy to sit back and compare and contrast. But I but I know now that I'm not going to be inheriting the earth anymore. I'm I'm out. I'm I'm a dinosaur. Uh, I am one of those, you know, people that go, oh, uh, these kids these days. Well, um, that's because I don't get it. And I that's and, and I don't think anybody does. That's part of why generations die out. And the young inherit the earth because they have a whole different way of thinking and way of looking at things, we tend to not understand uh, the language, you know, like all the language now that's, uh, that's very complex. And, uh, but it's always been that way, always been that way throughout our history. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the, probably in the cave person days, uh, the, uh, the old elders lamented, oh, the kids in their fire these days, what are they going to do? They're going to burn the world in their, their wills. Why do you need a will? You know, uh, so <laughs> I think it's yeah. just something that repeats. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, it's scary. I think it's always scary when it's something new, the, huh? when, and you can't pick it up as quickly 
you know, somebody said, one, I think it was my father-in-law the other day. He was like, I, I, this technology, I, I can't, I can't even keep up with it. I don't even understand. And, and believe me, we know that, that it's difficult to keep up with because we get all the calls that the remote's not working, that the internet's right. out, that the email is broken. And, and our, and I'm like, these are simple things, but then to the generation below me, I have people in our company that will be like, our CEO is so stupid. He can't even figure out how to send a PDF. You know, <laughs> you're like, well, I don't know. I've never sent this stuff. I don't have a clue what I'm doing here. And I'm, ma I'm making these things up. But the point no, that but, I'm getting at is yeah. it's very, it's rational to think that way. Yeah, it, that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. We operate within our, our, our experience in, in life. And then uh, there's, there's uh, exponential change that as there has been and continues to be with uh, devices and electronics and now AI. And, you know, everyone worries that we're advancing too fast beyond our maturity to be able to handle these things, which has always been the case, by the way. Um, I think this is just nature. Um, uh, we'll always complain about stuff like this. So we don't know. I I, I think uh, if we look to, uh, uh, you know, what we know about human primates, we are herd animals. Um, we cling, we group, we are not lone wolves, we're not hyenas. And so I don't think we're going to be. We need other people, we need interaction, or we go crazy, literally crazy. So uh, I don't think that's going to end at any time soon. We also tend to pair bond in herds. This has to do with our earliest pair bonding, which is with our caregiver, our primary. And so the end of coupling doesn't seem uh, uh, doesn't seem to be uh, coming anytime soon. It may be delayed because kids today are getting more in groups. They're still related, but they're getting more together in groups and they're not doing uh, love or sex as much anymore, which may affect our population growth as it does in Japan. But who knows? You know, we don't know. Um, uh, you know, we only fear uh, and guess and yeah. judge, but uh, time will tell. You know, well, all it, all it takes is all it takes is a change like war or something like that, mm -hmm. that, that totally changes the trajectory mm -hmm. of time. Everybody. I mean, 1940s yep. and the baby boomers came out of a moment where every man that went to war came back and said, time is short. Life is short. I need to make the most of this. And, and, um, you know, and there was a lot of babies that came out of that. And so, right. and, and millennials now outnumber the baby boomers for the first time in the, in the beginning of millennials are now turning 40. And to your point, we're now noticing things. I've been in financial services for 22 years, and we're noticing things that millennials were the do it yourselfer. And yeah. now they are, um, they've done it together, which is unique because they're one of the first generations to manage money and work together as a team. They've yeah. been in, they've, they've been in different realms at earlier times and a little more aligned on some things. And we're seeing stronger relationships out of that. We're also seeing longer relationships and more financially stable, which is really interesting because a lot of the baby boomers were very one-sided. There was one person, male or female, who was handling that stuff. And that created a lot of animosity and challenge going into the empty nest phase and beyond. And so, um, you know, I, I, to your point, anything could happen, anything could change, but it's just, it's interesting to watch. And the more we dedicate to learning about the other person, you know, really investing in the relationship, the better off we're all going to be. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And we're really shaped by necessity and by our own, and the environmental stressors and pressures, uh, mostly those that require us to survive, right? That or challenge us, our survival. And that does change us and more than genetics, I think. It's a, the environmental uh, drives and stressors that pressures that that will actually turn genes on or off. Um, and so uh, uh, it's a wait and see. Um, we're being tested all the time by life. So we apps a hundred percent wired for love. We have the fully revised and updated second edition. Tell me what, what changed, what updated, what are some <laughs> of the things, what are some of the things that people, you know, that, that, that studied your early work could now come back and be like, well, this, this had to be updated. These are some of the things that I wanted to make sure 
I really got out there into understanding right. your partner's brain and the other aspects of this of this wonderful book. Well, after you know, I wrote that in uh, 2012. It was the second book. The first one aimed at uh, at the at the, uh, the um, civilian. Let's say the, the the average person. The other ones are aimed at therapists and and caregivers. Um, so I, uh, you know, after writing so many books, looking back at 2012, I thought, oh boy, uh, I said that. Um, I need to correct that. I need to change that. Update that. And so a lot of that was uh, was tuning it up, but also talking about what happened and how we've been shaped since the uh, pandemic, but also being more inclusive. Because when I first wrote that book, uh, I was talking about heteronormative cisgendered relationship that was dyadic, right, only. But we know now that that excludes a lot of people and a lot of alternate kinds of relating. And so I don't like excluding people. I want to be inclusive. And so I had a chance, uh, an opportunity to uh, to write uh, uh, that in uh, to include uh, uh, you know, consensual non-monogamy, polyamory, uh, all sorts of variations that people choose uh, to be in love or non-romantic, but but you know, secure functioning relationships. And so, I think that's the that's the major change. But also, my my uh, evolving uh, uh, view of social justice theory as applies to couples and why it's so important to have to create co-create structure organization to shape this idea that's called a relationship which only only love uh, partners don't do uh you wouldn't dare do that in a business you wouldn't do that in a rock and roll group you wouldn't do that in a dance troupe you would know exactly what you're doing uh, and why you're doing it and where you're going and to attract people hey let's you know let's join up um only couples don't do that uh, and that's why there are problems. So the importance of two people co-creating, the being the architects of this thing called a relationship, they're the creators. If they don't like what they've created, uh, fix it, right? Because nobody did that except the two of you. So that idea, and then also dealing with the matter of how we will interact under stress and the problems that arise when uh, one or both of us is under stress, we change and we are more warlike. We are much more one person oriented, which is again, uh, not pro-relationship or even pro-social. So uh, that's the other important thing that I wanted to insert uh, in that book. So, yeah. yeah. I get it. I get it. I remember uh, releasing mine and when it was, I finished the third edit and I remember going, I'm going to change everything in this. I think so differently in, in the three, I actually, my book was supposed to come out in February of 2020. And so I, I held it because of the, the February or March of 2020. So I held it because of the pandemic, because yeah. it was like, the, if it just felt like the wrong time, then by the time I released it in September or whenever it was, so many things had changed. Changed, right? I mean, even even the references I had made to challenges in my career and my life were so uniquely different and changed from just one, yeah, six to eight month period. And so, to the exact point that that we made earlier with the generations and how how that's going to shape people, and um, it is it is really really impactful. So. I'm glad that uh, you've updated it. I, I think people uh, will enjoy learning from you. Invaluable for so many partners looking to reconnect and grow closer together. Gwyneth Paltrow, founder and CEO of Goop. And so um, Gwyneth is obviously someone that people follow for for romantic movies and uh, and great storylines and you have uh, developed quite a reputation and and I'm honored to have you on the show. Thank you. One, th one thing I just want to say about both Alanis and uh, Gwyneth is these are incredibly intelligent, powerful thought leaders. They are amazing people. And I think it's very hard because we're distant from those people because they're stars. But, uh, but these are uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, these are two extraordinary women. 
and that uh, only people who know them know this, uh, but uh, they're in incredible people. Uh, so I just wanted to give a shout out to them. I think that's great. And I, I think, I think people often uh, create again, a story of what they believe someone is based on characters they play or music that they write. And uh, I can tell you the artistic um, value that, that, Alanis brought to the table with with when she was just a young woman of of writing and the storylines she put on paper were amazing. And Gwyneth has been in some of the greatest movies that that have been created. So they're uh, they're strong in their careers, but they're also strong in their next life and their next career. And I love that point that you made. Um, Gwyneth's mother is Blythe Danner, I believe. And yeah. that is I have no idea if there's any relation to Scott Danner, but this is, uh, there are two Danners and not a lot of them out there. So, uh, um, you know, interesting dynamic, um, you want 23 and me, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll see. I, I, I think it's just cool to be, uh, to be learning and listening to, to people like you, Dr. Stan, how do people find you? What's the best way for them to learn from you and for you to continue to make your impact the way that you are driven for you and your wife to do into the future? Thank you. Well, people can find me and everything I'm talking about, including our trainings, which is worldwide uh, for mental health professionals. And um, my wife and I do couple work workshops and couple of retreats. So um, you can go to the pact p a c t institute.com so the pact institute.com is where you can find me and all this information and all of our programs well dr stan i'm i'm very grateful for the time i'm also grateful for your humility because we started off with some technical difficulties today and <laughs> uh you practice the the patient voice that you have is one that you actually practice and I'm very grateful for it. It's been an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you liked it, there's more where this one came from. Click here and enjoy some more.